And happy Friday to you. I hope you're doing well. It is Friday, the 17th of August at 4.30 in the afternoon, and we are in our third, our third episode of Stump Justin. So for those of you who are just joining us for the first time on Friday afternoons at 4.30, we're live on Facebook. This is then rebroadcasted um, into YouTube. And the whole idea was our team here thought it was a good idea for some reason with all the various questions that we get during the week. And trust me, we get a ton of them. I have probably, I'm looking on a screen here right next to my camera, and there are probably 15 questions on here that we've gotten throughout the week from various internet sites that um, like our Facebook, our YouTube, our Twitter, Instagram, people have been asking us questions all week. And I realized that Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon is probably not the time when your mind is functioning to peak performance. I'm with you. This week, I am like Dane Bread. Yeah, Dane Bread. My brain isn't even working properly. I have been in depositions this week. I have been working on cases nonstop this week. I have just finished up just today, almost six and a half hours behind a camera today, and my head is, he is tired. Nonetheless, we're going to jump into the Stump Justin Friday edition. And like I said, a lot of people during the week have been uh, sending us um, questions through Facebook, through our Justin at Financially Simple. You can email me there, justin at financiallysimple.com. Email a question there if you can't make it to our Friday edition. Um, we got a couple of questions off Twitter this week. You can connect with me on Twitter. I had one even come in on Instagram. So a lot of different questions coming in. And nonetheless, if you're going to join in here live, as this kind of rolls in, we have people that jump in and jump out just because of time. You know, Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon, people are like ready to adios, get out of the office. And so a couple of you will check it into the uh, Facebook Live edition at Friday. So with that, I want to deal with a couple of these questions. And like I said, at any time during today's episode, feel free to drop a uh, question. If you're watching this after the live recording, which so many people do, I think we end up having like 1,200 people watch our one from last week already. And if you're one of those 1,200 people or more that we're starting to attract on these events, if you want to drop me a question, you said, Justin, I can't be there Friday at, five, at 4.30, shoot me a message in LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email justin at financialsimple.com. Even on the podcast, if you go to Twitter, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, you can listen to the Financial Simple podcast. Speak of the podcast, we are right in the middle of a series on growing the value of your company. Now, most people think, Justin, you're a financial person. Why are you talking about that? Well, most of our clients are business owners. Most of my clients are business owners. We have a couple of mom and pops who, you know, are, are working for a, career, a job somewhere. But even then, they, those individuals work for the business owner. So a lot of our clients are business owner and they're trying to grow their business. So right now we're dealing with how to grow the value of your company so that you can turn around and sell it. But let's jump into these questions right here. Okay, so this one I thought was interesting. Right off the bat, we're going to start with the hardest question I think I received today for today's episode. The question is this. It says, Justin, Telsa, the car company, is talking about going private. And they put this in quotation. Telsa is talking about going private. I've heard of going private. Again, I'm reading this right off of, uh, I think this came to Twitter. I don't remember where this one came in from. Anyways, I said, tell us to talk about going private. I heard about going private, but what happens when a business goes private? And the follow-up question that was, and what does it mean? Okay. So we first have to understand there's a difference between private and public. So a publicly traded company is a company that's listed somewhere where individuals can buy interest or ownership. We call it shares. We can buy shares in the company. So um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe two, three weeks ago, Apple actually became the first trillion dollar company. They are a publicly traded company. So being there a publicly traded company, you and I, we can go out and buy Apple. Now here's my disclaimer for this, this series. I am not advising you to go out and buy Apple. Okay, I'm going to tell you today's information, as always, is for informational purposes only. You cannot act on this. This is not advice. Go out and talk to your own personal financial advisor. If you're a client of mine, this is not advice for you. I'm talking just educational purposes only. Okay, and I may slip up and I have to come back and change something. So I'm doing this real time on the fly. So I got to put my disclaimer out there. But so let's go back. Apple is a publicly traded company. It means you and I can buy shares in Apple. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying you can. However, Financially Simple is a private company. 
I'm the owner. More than likely, you're not going to buy shares in Financially Simple. And there's a number of reasons for that. So I have a private company. So if we understand public versus private, then we have to look at, well, why would Telsa move from a publicly traded company to a private? What does it mean? It means they're going to go through a series of transactions, a series of, it's not just, it can't just happen overnight, okay? Telsa is going to go through a series of transactions to convert themselves from what's currently a publicly traded company to now one that's owned by either one or two or just a smaller group of individuals. So once the company goes private, the shareholder is no longer able to trade their stocks in the open market. So let's say that you and I own a little bit of shares of Telsa. Let's just say that. If it goes private, I can't just go on the open market and easily sell them. It's not what's called liquid. I can't sell them really fast. Think about my company, Financially Simple. If I wanted to sell it today, I had to find a buyer. We'd have to agree on the price. We'd have to do valuations. We'd have to go through an intermediary more than likely. Do a lot of legal documents there. Whenever a company is public, there is a lot of individuals out there who are relying on the Securities and Exchange Commission's um, metrics to make sure that, that public company meets the standards. So if Telsa were to go private, it means they're, fault, they're coming off the exchanges to where you and I could sell them really fast. And they're going to go to where now those people who do own shares in the company would not be able to move their shares as rapidly typically. So that's what's called an illiquid asset or it's a private asset. Now, why would they do that? Well, there's a number of different reasons. I can't answer Telsa's reason for wanting to go private. I can't, I don't know. I haven't read this news. This question came in and guys, I've been busy. I hadn't even, didn't even know this was happening. But there's a number of reasons why people would want to go private. They may be doing it for additional de uh, leveraging, additional um, capital raising. Okay, they could be trying to get more money coming in. They could believe that their share price is way undervalued and they could come off the public exchange, grow the company even further, and then go back through another IPO, initial purchase offering, and try to bring the stock price even higher. Okay, we've seen that. Like Facebook is a real popular one that happened a couple of years ago. Hey, by the way, did you see like last Friday, um, Facebook dropped and um, Zuckerberg lost 20 billion in one day? I mean, it was like maybe two Fridays ago. It's crazy how much they dropped. 20% one day is crazy. Anyways, um, whenever Facebook went public, that company shot way up in price. So whenever um, Tesla, they may be saying, look, our stock, we think it's worth more than it actually is. We're going to take it off the markets and we may hold it for a while. We may come back public again. There's a number of reasons. But the question was, Tesla is talking about going private. I've heard of going private, but what does it mean? It means that you're going to move it from a listed equity position or a listed company on an exchange somewhere where a transaction, a buy-sell transaction can happen at rapid speed to now where it becomes a more illiquid asset to where private transactions are not as easy to make work. Okay, That's kind of what that means. So I hope that answers your question. I thought this question is interesting. And I want to read the second question. This actually came through on LinkedIn. Um, so if you're connecting with me on LinkedIn, feel free to drop me an instant message there. The question was, why should I hire a financial advisor? Aren't they just a waste of money? I'm like, dude, that is like the heart of so many questions out there. I mean, there's so many people in the financial world. And for the majority of people, I feel like the answer is, yeah, they are. Um, now, I know you're probably like, Justin, I didn't expect you to say that. Here's the reason. Here's the reason why I say that. If you're hiring somebody to manage money for you, let's say you have an old IRA and you want them just to manage the money for you. Technology today, for somebody who's disciplined, somebody, and that's a key, somebody who's disciplined, we can use technology at a very low discount and do reasonably well for ourselves using just some technology today. So if you're hiring a financial advisor just to manage money for you, yeah, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of money. I'm not sure I would do that. However, if you're hiring a financial advisor, a planner, someone who's looking holistically, not just at that investment account, but looking at your life, if you're hiring somebody like that and you lay out, here are the goals I want to achieve, one, two, three, four, and they have the, 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 the education and the background to be able to look at things like taxes and inflation and return on investment and asset allocation mixes, not just equities, but how about real estate and business interests, uh, non-traded issues. The list goes increasingly long and long, further and further. If you're hiring a financial advisor to hold you accountable to reach your goals, then chances are they're not worth the money you're paying them. They're probably worth much more than that. Okay. I'll give you an 
uh, example, we're going through our client list and um, we currently have just under 150 clients. I don't know the exact number. It's under 150 client households, okay, that are business owners, et cetera, they work with. And I'm looking at the client list and we're doing something for some auditors. And I'm just double checking math, double checking numbers. And the vast majority, I can make up a number right here, but I'm going to say the vast majority of our clients have zero debt, zero debt. Think about that. Why is it these people who are evidently successful are using their hard-earned monies that they've had now working toward and that they've accumulated to pay a financial advisory firm like ours? Why are they doing that? Because they want somebody to hold them accountable. That's what they're after. There was a study that was done not too long ago, and I heard about it through the military. And I want to say it was homeward bound or homeward. Uh, it's a military study. I'd have to find that. But it was talking about the number of military families that hire an advi a financial advisor, a true financial advisor who looks holistically at the whole life. Their net worth is almost double that of those who don't. Think about this. Michael Phelps. I, liked, I love watching the guy break all those records. Amazing. Michael Jordan, man, I can remember him going up and out of the court when I was a kid. Let's get outside of football and let's, let's get outside of sports. What about Kenny G? What about Elon Musk? We were just talking about him with Telsa. Something interesting that all these people have in common is they have a coach. They have someone who can look from the outside in and say, hey, you need to make some adjustments. They don't get offended. They actually pay them money to tell them when they're wrong. The same thing can be true for your financial advisor. So to answer your question, why should you have a financial advisor? If you have detailed goals and aspirations and you don't want to fall in with the rank and file, then you, can, you cannot afford not to hire somebody who's looking from the outside in helping you be all you can be. I think it's a military slogan, right? So I thought that was an interesting one there. So, hey, for those of you who just joined us, we got a lot of people jumping on the broadcast today. If you have a question, throw it out there. See if you can stump me. I'm, I'm going through questions right now that we received this week off of Twitter and Facebook, Instagram. Um, those of you who are going to watch this video later on and you're saying, Justin, I really want to ask you a question, shoot me a message through one of our uh, uh, social media portals, or you can go to Justin at financiallysimple.com and drop a question there, and I'll be sure to answer your question here on the air next week, okay? All right, here's a question that I received this week, and the question was, can I combine multiple retirement accounts? Can I combine multiple retirement accounts? So let me explain what typically happens for the way I see it. You know, these days we don't stay at a job for 40 years. Those of us who are, who, those individuals who are employed. Job tenure moves a lot faster than that because of technology, because of a number of other things. And so we go to work at a company and we sign up for their 401k. And as we sign up for their 401k, then we're there for just a short period of time. And after a short period of time, then we leave and we go somewhere else. And now we have X number of dollars, five, 10, 15, $20,000 in our 401k. And we go start another company and we start another company. And we start another company. Before you know it, we can end up with three, four, five different retirement accounts, as people call it, or 401ks. I have the saying that I like to say, whenever you leave your job, take your money with you. You left. Don't leave your money behind, okay? So to answer the question, can I combine multiple retirement accounts the answer usually is yes, usually. Now, there's always exceptions in the financial world. But yeah, you can roll multiple different 401ks or 403bs or 401as, like a, a client of ours talking about this week um, had. So you can roll multiple of these into IRAs, which stands for individual retirement accounts. You can do a rollover to put your monies in one consolidated place. What you can't do is you can't move oftentimes IRA monies opposite. You sometimes can't move IRA. Well, not many times you can move IRA monies to 401ks. That just doesn't work. You can move SEP IRAs to 401ks and 401k money to SEP IRAs and simples to SEP. I mean, you can fly them all different ways, right? So yeah, you can combine multiple retirement accounts. You can. That's going to ask the question then, well, how do you do it? Well, there typically are two ways you're going to handle moving your 401ks to an IRA to answer this this question that I'm going on here. Probably the most common way to do it is you call up your HR department after you're gone and say, look, I'm no longer here. I want to do a rollover and move my money either into my, my IRA or into now my current 401k. And you can do that. You move from company to company. You take your money to your next 401k. And the, the, the HR department is going to ask you one of two things. Depending on size, depending on their, the program that they're operating, 
they will either take your verbal instructions once you've confirmed who you are, like through social security, date of birth, privacy questions, all that. Or they may sometimes, some of the older plans still require, they'll send you a form, ask you to fill it out with your IRA or your new 401k's instructions on that form. You'll have to sign it. You'll send it back to your old HR department. They'll sign it. And then the custodian of those funds will move the money. The reason why they do that is to verify that you're no longer working there. Because if you're still working for a 401k company and you take money out, it's considered a distribution and you end up paying taxes and penalties many times. So to answer the question, can I combine multiple retirement accounts? Yeah, you can. You can. And oftentimes it makes sense. Okay. Oftentimes it makes sense. And like I said earlier, if you leave your company, you change jobs, take your money with you. You left the company. Don't leave it there. So for those, I've got more people jumping in right now, real time. For those of you who are jumping in, if you have a question, drop it in the comments. I'm watching it live feed here in front of me. And I'll see if you can catch me off guard. Do the stump Justin. No one has been able to stump me yet. Had somebody real close here try to, but um, off, the, off the air. It's like, nope, I can't get me on that one. All right, so here's another question that we got this week. This one came in through an email. And the question was, should I pay cash for my kid's college or have them borrow money? Now, that's an interesting question in and of itself. That could be philosophical in nature. But they went on to the next phase and they said, I'm not on track to hit my personal goals, but I'm feeling obligated to help them. So that's a very detailed question. I, the person who actually sent this to me, I'm not sure, I don't think I've ever met him. I thought it was a very interesting question. So what happens is, and I saw this actually twice this week in my office with current clients and one a prospect client. What they said is, Justin, I have X number of dollars. We ran the math out. It's not enough for them to meet their personal goals, okay? but they have children starting college this week, like next week, two weeks from now, they have kids starting college. And like, man, I, I don't know if I can get the lending in place right now. I don't even know if I should borrow the money. Shouldn't I just take the money out of my accounts and go pay college? Okay, so here's the way I view this. And I think I did an episode on this not too long ago somewhere. <clears throat> Whenever I rode on an airplane to Texas not too long ago, I was listening to the stewardess, uh, in this case, a stewardess who said, Please put your oxygen mask on yourself first. If you're riding with little ones or if someone needs your help, then help them next, okay? Same thing applies with college. So many times parents, and I'm one, we believe that we need to help our kids, give them a better advantage in college. And so we, to our own detriment, help our children. That's what this question is centered around. They said, I'm not on track to meet my personal goals, but I feel obligated to help them. You're not, you're not obligated to help your children, okay? I know we have that desire to do that. I do, I'm a parent, I know. I know I wanna put my kids in a better position than, than I am, okay? But I, it doesn't do me any good to take the monies that I'm working for is that for later in life, to t rob my future self to help provide for my kids college today. I asked one of our clients this week, and we're actually gonna meet with her son here in a couple of weeks. I said, you know, who do you think your son would rather hear? You think you'd rather approach him and say, son, I, we can't pay your student loan anymore. But if we do pay your student loan anymore, we need you to have a room in your house because we're going to move in with you in the last 10 years of our life. Which would you think the son would rather have happen? Do you think they'd rather pay their student loan at two, three hundred dollars a month? Or do you think they'd rather have a house to whom you're going to now move into the room in? And the parents both said, yeah, they're not going to have us move in. I said, well, that's where you're headed. If we continue to do what we're doing, we're not going to have enough money for you to sustain your lifestyle going forward. You're going to have to drastically cut back your lifestyle all for the immediate need of trying to pay for your kid's college. So when it comes to college planning, remember, you cannot, cannot subsidize your future income after you quit working. You cannot. But your kids can carry debt throughout their working career. Now, is it the best? No, it's not the best, but they can. Perhaps a better way to do this is for them to like in their in Tennessee, go to two years associate school for free, then transfer over to a four year program and only have two years worth of tuition and work while they go to school. We can do that, use that four letter word work. And on top of that work, we can help them a little bit out of cash flow, but they can carry some student loans. It's gonna help them be ultra responsible for their own education. So I thought that was interesting. Good question this week, by the way. All right. So for the, I've got a couple more people, man, people are jumping on, jumping off back and forth. So for those of you who just jumped on, if you have a question, feel free to just drop it inside the comments. I'm watching it real time. No questions coming in there. 
Um, but we're going to continue to answer these questions that I received this week. So those of you who are watching us in the future, maybe throughout this week, if you have a question for me, drop me an email, justin at financiallysimple.com. Come on Facebook, come on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Speaking of LinkedIn, here's a question that came in from LinkedIn. A private message to me, they said, I just met with a financial person who tried to sell me a product which has a yield, which I'm sorry, which he says, read word for word, which he said will yield 9% over the next eight months. Whoa. He wanted to put all of my money in this one product. Sounds fishy. What are your thoughts? All right. So that's an interesting statement. So I don't know what this product is. I don't know who this financial person is, but I've got a couple of problems here. All right. So first of all, this statement said he wants to put all of my money into one product. Let's put a different word on it. Enron. Okay. Enron. Remember that, remember that company? Now, it's been some time ago. Some of us who I see jumping on, jumping off are a little bit younger than me. You may not remember that saying. Enron was a major disaster. A lot of people lost their entire life savings because they had money into one asset in the Enron in this case. We call it asymmetric risk. All right. The whole stock market could be cruising upwards at whatever index you want to track could be cruising upwards. Okay. And one individual stock could be going opposite. We saw this happen in Facebook just a couple of weeks ago. Like I mentioned earlier in the, in the live broadcast here, Mark Zuckerberg lost $20 billion in one day. Asymmetric risk is what we call that. So to answer this question that I was sent this week, I just met a financial person who tried to sell me a product. Number one warning, ding, ding, ding. If you're talking with any financial person who's trying to sell you, sell your product, get on your tennis shoes, get in the car and drive as fast as you can to a registered investment advisor who's not going to try to sell you a product. Because whenever you say, whenever somebody's trying to sell you something in this world of finance, run. The way my dad used to say it, he said, son, if all I have is a hammer, if that's the only tool I have, everything looks like a nail. So in other words, if all I have is a hammer, it's going to have to fit. I'm going to nail in a screw. I'm going to nail in the bolt. I'm going to nail in everything because that's all I got. It's a hammer. Now, if I had a complete toolkit, then I could find the right tool for the problem. So in this particular thing, I'm seeing bells go off. The financial person tried to sell me a product. Run. Finances is not about a product. It's about advice and it's about concepts. Okay. Then he said, it will yield 9%. We cannot say in our industry, I cannot say what your return's going to be. There's no way. In fact, we have to say past performance is not indicative of future results. That's the compliance world that I operate in. But this person says it's going to yield 9%. Yeah, good luck with that. Then to make it, no, it's going to be 9% historically over a 20 or 30 year period of time. No, it's going to be 9% in the next eight months. And I'm like, what in the world type of advisor is going to go out and say you're going to make 9% in the next eight months. CD rates right now are only like one and a half, two percent. So then not only that, then they say they're going to put all of my money in this one product. Question, sound fishy behind that. Yeah, this doesn't sound fishy. It sounds like you just walked up on a shrimp boat with all the shrimp are dead in the hole. And if you've ever done that, you know that stinks. Oh my, this is like rotten fish stink. Yeah, it doesn't sound fishy. It smells fishy. I would run Run, 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 run the other way. Fine. Investing is not rocket science. Stocks, bonds, cash. That's it. If in there any variation, so you have exchange traded funds, mutual funds, et cetera, um, index funds, which is a type of mutual fund, but it's a combination of stocks, bonds, cash. Whenever you get outside the basics, you better be have you better have a smaller amount of your portfolio, not all of your money in one thing that sounds fishy. So the question was, I just met with a financial person who tried to sell me a product, which he said will yield 9% over the next eight months. He wanted me to put all my, pro all my money in this one product to sound fishy. Yeah, it sounds fishy. Run. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Got another question that came in through Twitter. Twitter, so this we rebroadcast this through Twitter. Someone said, hey, Justin, here's my stump question. I know it's not really a stump. But it's a question I had for you. Do you, talking about me, do you ever not take on new clients and why? Yeah, I do. There are some times we don't take on clients. And what I would like to say is prospective clients, because if it's a client, they're already working with them. But are there reasons why we won't work with some people? Yeah, there is. Number one, we've had it happen here recently where we have a lot of people come in at one time, want us to work with them. And we physically cannot service to the level of our service that many individuals at one time. So that's a good problem to have. So we've had times like that. 
we have times where the client's expectations are unrealistic. If someone says I have, I actually had this happen not too long ago. They said, um, I was on a phone call with somebody and they said, I want to retire with $3 million in 20 years. And I said, well, that means you should have about $300,000 right now. And you're saving somewhere around $35,000, $40,000 a, a year. And like, uh, no. And I said, okay, your expectations are unrealistic. And so if in that initial meeting, if the expectations are unrealistic, we're not going to work with them. Another one is, is when people try to hide stuff from me. If I find out that there's accounts or businesses or something, they say, no, all we want you to look at is this, not doing it. See, as a fiduciary, I need to know the whole world. I know what you're dealing with holistically. And if I can't, I'm not going to work with you. Sorry. So now there's some financial advisors out there. So you bring them an account in, they're going to look at that account and say, yeah, here's what we can do with that account. Well, man, that's, that's not us. Okay. So do we ever not take on a client? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, why? So that's the reason why. Um, got a question here that came in through Facebook and it said, Justin, is there a question that people always forget to ask their certified financial planner? That one almost stumped me because the one time I see the word always, it bothers me. So is there a question that people always forget to ask their CFP? Let me tell you what I would ask my CFP. Show me your finances. That's what I would ask. I think as I think it's fair to me that you know how your investment advisor is investing their own money. Now, does that mean that investment advisor or that financial advisor, that CFP needs to know, needs to have the same net worth that you do? Not at all. Not at all. Remember Michael Phelps, I mentioned that earlier. I don't know the name of his coach. I've been watching him on there. I don't think his coach ever broke Olympic records. Don't think it's the case. And here's another thing. Take Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, arguably, I think, one of the best basketball players of all time. He's a lousy coach. His team was a Hornets or the Rockets or something. It's awful, awful. So just because someone knows how to make money doesn't mean they can teach making money. And just because someone doesn't have money doesn't mean they can't teach you how to make money. Okay, so just be careful of that. But one question I would ask every financial advisor is, let me see your finances. I think it's important. I think you can get a lot from the way somebody invests their money. And if they're honest and they're open, then you can build a very good advisor-client relationship that's on an equal playing field. What I'd be cautious of is when the advisor thinks they're above you. Or I'd be cautious if you, the client, think you're above the advisor. I often get that with medical doctors. They drive me batty. Medical doctors come in, they talk down to you oftentimes. Not always, but it's like, oh, I can't, I can't deal with that. But you want to be open and honest with your financial person. So I thought that was a great question. So here's the last question we're going to hit with today. So those of you who are still on here, if you have a question, you got one more second here to jump it in while I answer this last question. The last question we're going to go over today came in. Uh, make sure I don't have any questions here. Nope. All right. The last question came in, and I don't remember how this, this may have been an email. I don't remember. Um, the team puts these things together. But here's the question. Is a robot advisor even better for me than a custom plan from an advisor? So is a, rev is a robot advisor better or a custom advisor from a financial advisor better? So here's the way I'm going to say it. For the majority of people, a robot's better. And you're going to say, really? Yeah, really. So here's when I think you need to hire somebody that is custom. We can build custom plan work for you. If you're a business owner, hire a planner. You have no exception, hire a planner. There's too many moving parts. You have the business world, which has multi-assets, and you have your personal world, which has that multi-assets. You need to hire a planner who understands business. So if you're a business owner, hire a planner. You say, Justin, it's not worth the money. Yeah, it is. If you hire the right planner, they can make you money. Okay, maybe not every day, but over a period of time, they can save you money. So if you're a business owner, hire a planner. If you're climbing, so Mount Everest, you know, if you climb Mount Everest, they say from base camp to the summit is very dangerous. Right? We've seen climbing Everest with a movie and all the different deaths that occur. But the majority of deaths happen on the downside of Mount Everest, coming back down to base camp, which is why they hire Sherpas to help them get up to the top of the peak and come down the peak. If you're within 10 years of retirement or you just retired and you're coming down 10 years past retirement, hire a planner. You can't mess up. You cannot mess up. You cannot allow your emotions to harm you. The number one thing about personal finance is it's more personal than finance. You can find all the questions on Google, but what you can't have is somebody's going to sit down, look you straight in the eyes and say, do not do this. It's going to hurt you. 
that you respect, that you will listen to. So you need to have, a robot's not gonna do that. Now, if you're not a business owner and you're not 10 years to retirement or coming out of retirement, the only other time where I see that you need to hire a planner is whenever major life events happen. The birth of a baby, a marriage, a divorce, a business breakup, where maybe you've got an employee and you're caught up in a business divorce, like with some options and things of that nature. Outside of that, I personally don't see for many people why you need to hire a planner. I'm just being honest, just being honest. But if you're within those areas, I demand you, I'm like, you got to hire a planner. You may say one other thing. You may say, Justin, it's just too complicated. I don't want to learn it. I want to have somebody who I know and trust. And we have a lot of clients that don't meet any of those three or four things. But they said, guys, we trust you. We want you to stay on top of it. We don't want to deal with this. We want you to stay on top of it. And to us, we see value in paying a planner for that advice. So that was the, um, that was the question. Is a robot advisor better for me than a custom plan by an advisor? And so the way I say that, answer that question is this. If you're a business owner, hire a planner. If you're 10 years up, 10 years out, up, down from retirement, hire a planner. If you have major tax issues, hire a planner. If you have major light events, hire a planner. If you're working an average job, like a lot of people are good, hardworking Americans, more than likely you can get free advice. More than likely you can use a robot and be just fine. More than likely you can. So I hope that answers the questions for this week, guys. My voice is shot. I have been talking probably 60 hours this week. I'm out of here. Before I go, let me point you in two things. Number one, next week, we're going to be here answering the same questions. I had probably, I was only able to get through maybe seven, eight questions this week. If you have a question for me, leave a message somewhere in this system, either through Facebook. What's up, buddy? Good to see you, man. If you have a question, leave a uh, leave it here in the system. If you want to shoot me an email, justin at financiallysimple.com. Justin at financiallysimple.com. Drop us a question there. Our team will get it, get it to me next week, like they did this week. If you're, in, if you're driving in the car this week, do me a favor, go into the podcast, go to iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, any of the major, um, iHeartRadio, I think we're on there now, any of these major portals, you go there and listen to the Financially Simple Podcast. I'm dealing specifically right now with business owners and how we can grow the value of our company. So guys, that's it for this week, Friday, and I am out of here. Like I said every week, life is hard. Life is hard. I've seen some pretty tragic things this week. But life is good. One of our clients had a baby. I was like rejoicing with them this week. Uh, one of our clients, daddy, made it through a heart uh, pacemaker implant this week. God bless some prayers. God, life is good. Money is frustrating, but it doesn't have to be. Hey, guys, let's continue to make our lives at least financially simple. Y'all go out and create an outstanding weekend. We'll see you on the flip side.